meeting host will let me in soon, it says. Don't let him in. Do you know where you're sitting, by the way? <laughs> well, let's come to order. It is uh, exciting to be back uh, into a new session of the Human Services Reform Committee. Uh, there is lots of things to talk about, uh, and we're maybe close to exiting COVID. I don't know. hate to predict that, but um, it'd be nice to be. I think this committee is in full favor of that being done. Um, but there's been a lot of challenges in the uh, communities that we serve and the industries that serve the people we care so much about. Um, and we'll be uh, working through our, our way. Um, and this is our uh, first in-person, well, actually, we're hybrid. We were hybrid. Um, first. Yeah, we, yeah, the first one this year. But I'm just trying to remember the last one that we had that was normal. So it's been two years. We were the last one to meet usually in the first one to be hybrid. So here we are hybrid again. So anyway, um, and so welcome everybody. Uh, we have uh, a lot of things to do. Let me just give you a quick lay of the land for what's gonna be happening in the next uh, two weeks. Today we're gonna act on uh, a couple projects. We cannot move the bills because they were introduced today, so we're gonna act on those. Uh, we're, hopefully we can have all the discussion we could possibly have on these two bills and then put them to rest. And then it's, uh, it's my intention that on Tuesday we would um, take the recodification bill and move that out to the floor um, without discussion. Uh, and of course, if we need to discuss something, we can, but it'd just be nice to get that squared away because we're also doing the governor's budget that day and we want to leave enough time for them to have the balance of the hour, uh, hour and a half. Um, and also we're going to take up some waiver extensions today. And there's a... This is probably the, uh, the only bill really leaving port for a little while uh, that could be fully agreed upon at least soon. And so the, you'll notice we're adding a few topics on here which I believe will be worthy of discussion and germane to um, uh, either something urgent um, that we, we want to work on or COVID related. Uh, and the way this, this bill works uh, so well is um, if the four chairs uh, two from the House, two from the Senate agree, and the administration agrees, that's in the bill. If one um, group did not want to do it, then we would, that would fall off. So uh, that's how you handle it, agreed upon stuff and move it quick. So with that, um, I want to welcome everybody back again. Um, the first bill we're going to take up today will be Senate File 2774, and again, uh, we cannot act on it, but we can review, um, I think there's an amendment. Um, to that, is that right, Mr. Monahan? Um, and so we're not going to act on anything, but we're going to review it, and then as quickly as we can come Tuesday next week, we're going to act on those and send it on its way. So, um, Mr. Monahan, I think I'll just turn it over to you, and I want to thank you for investing a good part of your summer in this. Um, it's a, such a complex area, and I'm really happy you and your house counterpart uh, rose to the occasion to, and I think this is really a priority to get done. So hopefully this can sail right through and then we can have an easier time in this committee. So, Mr. Monahan. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, Senate File 2774 uh, is really just a reorganization of the language that governs the disability waiver um, rates setting system. And um, as some background, there was a revisor's instruction in last year's HHS uh, policy bill that instructed the revisor to use their editorial authority to try to make that section easier to read and easier to amend. But the revisor, upon reflection, decided they didn't have the editorial authority to make the extensive changes that would be required. So instead, they suggested that uh, Senate Council and House Research draft a bill in order to achieve the legislature's intent. And so that's what we've done. The bill's now been introduced. Your packets, though, include uh, an earlier uh, draft that's nearly identical to the one that was jacketed, though the um, reviser did make some technical changes. Um, and I just want to give you some highlights of, of what the language is doing and, and make sure you understand 
what's contained in the bill. So its primary purpose is to reorganize the statutes without, without changing the meaning or effect of the statute, and that's really important. If anybody between now and Monday reviews the language and, and believes that the language does change the effect of the underlying statute or changes the rate calculations or changes the math, please, please <laughs> let me know, because that is not the intent of this bill. Okay? It really should change nothing about the rate calculations or the policy. Um, you will notice as you look through the bill that it looks like a lot of language is deleted and it looks like a lot of language is added. Uh, but that's actually not really what's happening. What's happening is language is being moved from one place to another. So unless the language was completely obsolete, the language you see stricken is recreated somewhere else in the bill. And the new language that you see, unless it's um, really short phrases that are maybe changing terms, the big chunks of new language aren't actually new. What they are are recreations of the language that already exists in the statute. Um, many of the rate calculations um, had multiple services included in the same language. And so you'd read the language and it was full of exceptions and qualifications and except for this service, do this other thing instead, and it became a nightmare to try to amend. So what we did is we pulled it all apart and each service got its own rate calculation independent of any other service that was uh, in the statute. So don't be frightened by all the new language. Don't be frightened by all of the deleted language. I can assure you that nothing should be changing. <laughs> um, and if this gets enacted, it will make nonpartisan staff's life a whole lot easier. It will uh, speed up the process of creating committee reports and conference committee reports. We spend an inordinate amount of time dealing with this particular section when it comes to creating conference committee reports. Um, so that's a point in its favor. Uh, what else to say? There's not much else, else to say um, other than uh, we shared the language with some uh, stakeholders who had a chance to review it, um, except for a few missing words. They didn't find anything significant. The department um, has seen it, um, but I will let them speak for themselves if they choose to, um, to do so. Thank you, Mr. Monahan, and I really appreciate your work. And uh, I always like a chance to uh, commend uh, the, the Senate Council and, and, and the House Research folks. They are, I, I just find them nothing short of amazing. Their dedication to the detail that's so important and their, their memories. And then jumping into a project like this. And so uh, the weekend's coming. I think this is the kind of thing, just as uh, members of the committee and of the public, you know, get a little glass of wine and kind of read through the whole section. You'll have a better feeling <coughs> for uh, DWRS, I think we'll be sure to send a copy to Senator Rosen. Uh, Senator Hoffman, did you want to say something? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and um, I'm glad you mentioned Senator Rosen. The, uh, I, I was smiling underneath my mask as, as uh, Mr. Monahan was uh, finally lining up the cans in the kitchen um, regarding DWRS, and it, it reminds me of the story when Senator Rosen was sitting between then at the time Representative Abler and I, and we were talking about DWRS, and after three hours of debating on what to do with these two thick, honest to God, the two bills, yeah, the department bill was this thick, and then the advocates bill was this thick, and um, she looked at Jim and I and said, I'm never sitting in between you two ever again. So I think there's post-traumatic stress on that, but when we combine those two bills, it, it, it's just, I was smiling because to hear you say, you know, we're going to finally clean some of this language up so it becomes you know, a lot easier and efficient 
to, to utilize because it's a big system, DWRS. So um, hats off to, to you for uh, tackling this of what was started 10 years ago in the basement of the Capitol, having a discussion on, oh, my goodness, the feds are telling us we have to change our system. So I'm, I'm full of joy. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the word to the wise. Don't sit between us. That's probably smart. Um, anyway, uh, and so uh, maybe we'll have the department comment, and we'll take any discussion from the committee. And if anybody in the audience wish to uh, testify for or against this, I'm happy to take that testimony. So, Mr. Burdick, who's here from you to comment on this? Ms. Grom, there you are. Looks like you're unmuted. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, we have reviewed this language, and we do um, think that these changes are are good changes. We support anything that's going to make the lives of our nonpartisan staff a little bit easier. And I will say that I have spent many an hour um, also drafting technical assistance in DWRS, and um, so this will also make our lives easier. So we we appreciate um, Senate Council's work on this. Well, thanks. And Ms. Grom, I don't suppose we can get a fiscal savings out of this bill, then, uh, since you're going to be having less staff time. Maybe you can take that up with Mr. Greenman. Um, okay, any, uh, any comments from staff or from the members at all? Yeah. Well, very good. I, I just appreciate this. And so we really do urge the, the public, uh, whatever that, that includes a lot of different people, just to review this and make sure it's squared away. Um, Mr. Monahan, there'll be a delete all then come on Tuesday uh, to the bill, and that's that would be the format we'd be going in. Is that right? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, the uh, the jacketed bill will just need the A1 amendment at oh, this point. It's okay, very, very good. Short and technical. All right. Uh, unless I receive some feedback between now and Monday at right. one o'clock. Okay. Or, yeah. Well, so that'll be the plan. So to the public, we're going to. You know, move the bill, adopt the amendment, and send it out unless there's any other concerns. So, with that, uh, thanks for that. Let's let's move on. Uh, the second topic today is going to be handled in a similar way um, because we can't act on it. Uh, pesky Senate rules. Uh, probably it's good process. You can't introduce a bill and vote on it the same day. We do want the public to be um, alerted to what's going on, and and uh, just to comment, I if. If the public, the public, I just sound so impersonal, but if people that are interested in this, these topics feel that they have not had enough time, that I've rushed things through or been unfair, we do want people to be allowed to testify and to know what we're doing. And so um, that's what we're after. So if we fail, then help us do better. Um, so um, the... Uh, this has been a <coughs> Senate file 2876 has been a product of some collaboration and technical advice uh, between uh, both House and Senate and the administration. And uh, one of those elements involves money, and so that's uh, they're giving me advice about how to continue um, the, uh, the the fund for uh, emergency staffing because um, that's not part of the governor's budget. But we in the I think both the House and Senate agree it's something really important. Um, and so um, I think to proceed, um, Mr. Burdick, who would uh, be suited from you all just to kind of go through this, um, just to cut out the middleman? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to kick us off, and then I've got a team of folks that can walk through the specifics. Oh, perfect. Yeah, why don't you just, just do that, and then we have some additions that we're going to talk about. So let's cover the bill as is, and then uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Matt Burdick, Director of State Government Relations with the Department of Human Services. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this legislation with you all today. For context, this was born out of some of the work that we did during the heart of the pandemic when the peacetime emergency was in place. Governor Walls enacted Executive Order 20-12, which gave the Commissioner of Human Services broad flexibilities to be able to change how we deliver human services in our state to accommodate the unique changes that were needed um, in light of the pandemic. It was a really collaborative process, as the chair mentioned. We had to consult with our chairs on any changes that we wanted to enact and could not move forward if any of the chairs objected. We ended up enacting over 100 waivers to our rules and regulations over the course of that time, and not a single one was vetoed by our chairs. We feel really great about that. 
We also worked with the committees as we put together the omnibus bill last year to continue some of the waivers that we knew we would need ongoing. However, the arc of the pandemic was not predictable, and so we did not um, continue all of the waivers that we needed in light of the Delta and Omicron searches. And so what you see before you is bringing back some of those flexibilities that we've heard from folks in the community, from counties, from providers, from people receiving services that would be really helpful in um, helping to be responsive to the pandemic. And so that's what this bill here today does. There is also um, the A1 amendment that I'll just speak to briefly that sort of um, relate to the underlying bill. This is largely technical in nature. We are clarifying some of the effective dates and it's also adding an additional waiver that I believe our county partners will be here to speak about as well. But I'm gonna first turn it over to my colleague, Deborah Schlick, to talk about section one, clauses one and two. Welcome, Ms. Schlick, nice to see you again. Welcome back, here we go, you ready? I am <laughs> ready, ready. for the session, yeah, okay. Nice you can be here and thanks for being here today. Thank you, Senator Abler, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, so section one, paragraphs one and two of the bill uh, would return waivers that allow verbal con confirmation of information on an application. When a, someone who's applying for assistance is unable to access the internet, is unable to come into a local county or tribal office because the office is closed um, or because of concerns about exposure to COVID. Um, this would apply to all cash assistance programs in Minnesota and it aligns with the federal waiver currently in place uh, for the federal uh, supplemental nutrition assistance program, SNAP, that used to be called food stamps. And the next number two is very similar. And that is that um, people applying for assistance or already receiving assistance could give local eligibility workers verbal permission to contact a third party to confirm information they've submitted when it's impossible to give them written permission. So that's to call an employer and ask to share pay stubs or uh, the other sort of information needed to determine eligibility. Thank you. Mr. Burnett. Mr. Burnick. Chair, I think next up we have uh, our Inspector General, Kalani Moti, who can speak to Section 1, Clause 3. So, Ms. Moti, hello. Hello, my name is, uh, for the record, my name is Kalani Mosey. I'm a service the Inspector General here at DHS. And um, the first one that I'll be speaking for right now is the waiver regarding our background study. So this waiver would allow DHS to waive mandatory supervision requirements if submitted under federal law. And this would be giving us, again, the authority to make case-by-case -case decisions, permitting some individuals to work without supervision while their background study is being processed. What this also um, continues to allow us to do is to continue the transition that we would need to do from emergency studies to fingerprint-based studies while giving us an ability to address workforce shortages for some groups while allowing more study subjects to work while the studies are being completed. Um, the ones that we wouldn't be allowed to do under the federal requirements are gonna be related to childcare providers in our Title IV child residential facilities and Title IV foster residential settings as they have um, specific provisions um, that require a completed study prior to beginning work as per federal compliance. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks. And just to mention in public, there's been some a number of contacts to me about the, the two-week deadline to get things done and then a two-week hiatus you have to wait for. Um, we still want to work on that. That just doesn't seem reasonable and don't want to drag it out, but it's it just, uh, so we'll discuss that. And I, I think that we could spend a good long time talking about fingerprinting, but I think this is at least as a start toward that. So, um, I, and I think, uh, anybody want to talk about this section? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, the, the question to the department, I'm glad you brought up the two week, two week, because then people have to start the process all over again is, are they putting timelines on this case by case? Are they gonna address that within that subdivision they just talked about? Uh, Ms. Modi, I know you didn't come to talk about that, but are you equipped to comment about the whole two week thing in general and do people have to pay again too if they, so can you comment? Do you have, are you up for that? Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think I can comment um, 
on a little bit of it, but we're also happy to have a, 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 conference, a conversation offline about our, our, I think you're talking about our two week print window, which is um, people have two weeks to be able to get in once the study's initiated to um, get a fingerprint done. There are um, uh, ways for people to ask for an exception for that window to be extended on it. And while what this would allow to do on this, this waiver does pass, is during that entire time as we're trying to they're trying to get the fingerprint in and whatnot, we would be able to um, they'd be able to work without supervision during this time while they're going in and getting this. And we do do it on a case by case basis, so there's occasions where we don't um, grant that, but it would give us that um, ability to um, be able to let them work while they're processing the fingerprint. And I appreciate that. I just want to continue to remind you and the department that a lot of these people that are working are not that sophisticated. I'm not that sophisticated to figure out who to even ask for an exception. And I just have a no person runs a child care center and he didn't know how to work around this. And so when does it, when it's like they're ready to go and then they're off by a day and then they have to wait two weeks, they're gonna go get a job anywhere else. And so it seems like it's just a real issue. Uh, and I don't know that we can address it in this bill, but it, it's, it just seems, and, some things just seem reasonable and some things don't. And if I help write the law that's unreasonable, then I will accept my responsibility for that. Um, but it's just a, a concern. And, um, and so I'll just also comment that if there's ever a chance for a need for a lot of workarounds, then maybe this system needs to be uh, made to be a little simpler for the, 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 the you know, the garden variety provider who doesn't have a lot of legal counsel and is just trying to make it work. So, do you want to comment to that, Ms. Modi? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the things is, is that it, we do have a lot of um, help information that is on our website. We have our contact center um, in there that can um, help walk people, help walk our providers through asking for an extension um, on that. But we, as um, with all of our back and studies processes, we're constantly reviewing and seeing where there are pain points so that we can see if there's any adjustments um, that might be needed. So this, this is definitely on our radar and we are um, taking a look at this. Happy to hear that. And we'll be talking again and I know you have a lot on your plate too. So thanks for that. Um, moving on to the Mr. Burdick, who has the next one? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Grom has the next uh, provisions that we'll talk about. Hello, Ms. Grom, welcome back. Mr. Chair, uh, Christy Graham with the Department of Human Services. So I will start with CB53. Um, so this is a, a COVID waiver that relates to the personal care assistance program. Specifically, this waiver would allow the option um, and the flexibility for qualified professionals to provide oversight via phone or internet instead of in person. So qualified professionals are the workers who oversee our um, individual PCA workers. So they play a really important role in providing training, supervision, um, they develop care plans, and they really make sure that people's needs are being met and that people are, um, are satisfied with the services that they're getting. Under current law, they do have some ability to provide oversight remotely, um, but there are, uh, there are certain instances where the observation and oversight needs to be in person. So for example, when someone is just, just starting services. So this waiver will um, allow QPs the option of remote supervision to ensure that if a person doesn't want um, someone coming into their home because they're concerned about you know their underlying health conditions that might put them at higher risk for COVID or something like that um, that that choice can be honored and then we're still able to provide um, that added layer to ensure safety and, and professional oversight for PCA services can pause there and um, answer questions or I can move on to the next waiver depending on your, your okay questions. any questions Here. from members uh, don't see any so yeah thank you uh, who's next I will cover um, Mr. Chair CB89. Okay. Um, so this um, waiver that we're seeking an extension for um, would allow lead agencies um, to obtain verbal or expressed approval for support planning documents that typically would require in-person uh, wet signatures. So a little bit of background. Um, currently, waiver case management visits and assessment and support planning meetings can occur virtually. And, and many people are choosing to um, to get those to have those meetings virtually. So CB89 really aligns with those current flexibilities so that case managers or support planners don't have to um, go out and obtain an in-person or, or wet signature after they meet with someone virtually. 
Um, as part of the assessment process, the lead agency will need to ensure that the person is informed of all of their options, that they know what they're eligible for, that the person is consenting to the services that, that are being authorized, and, and document all of those conversations in the person's support plan. All right. Um, questions? Senator Hoffman. I like that, Mr. Chair, because if your case is in, like in St. Louis County and you're receiving services in Washington County, you don't have to go get the wet signature. This is absolutely it's just common sense. Makes sense. More efficiency. So I'm glad they're I'm glad they're doing this, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah vote for common sense. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, I think that's the end of the section one. Any questions on section one from any members? Seeing none. Uh, section two, please. Mr. Burton. Mr. Chair. Um, our next testifier will be Lori Prusay, who will talk about that. Good afternoon, members of the committee chair. I'm Lori Posseen, the manager of the Child Care Assistance Program at uh, Department of Human Services. And uh, section two is a reinstatement of um, part of a waiver that we used uh, during the peacetime emergency to provide support and relief for families and providers. Um, this particular piece would pay a provider who closes uh, due to health reasons. Um, the limit is eight weeks throughout the duration of the temporary law change. Um, and what we saw during the peacetime was there were cycles of two to three weeks at a time when centers, particular smaller programs um, or family child care needed to close. Um, CCAP the child care assistance program does pay absent days when a child, you know, singular child has to be absent due to sickness or other reason, but closures are typically not paid. So what this does is allow that eight weeks of payment um, due to health reasons, the provider has to request and we would review and approve. Um, and uh, it also um, specifically allows a provider to not charge private pay families. This provision uh, was included last time and um, is again because it relieves some pressure on providers to not feel forced to charge private pay families. Um, some do and some don't. Some, uh, you know, we, we got feedback that this was an important provision. Um, and um, again, repeating that we, we currently pay absent days and there's some absent day exemptions with medical reasons that can um, support providers um, and families as well, but that really doesn't apply when the whole program has to close temporarily. Um, all right, so um, maybe you can just help me, Ms. Hosseen, thank you for being here. Um, so the eight weeks could be sequential, it could be all in one big chunk, or it could be two weeks here and two weeks there. Is that the intent of this, for a total of eight weeks in the period? Uh, yes, Chair Abler members. Um, the reason we didn't try to put one pattern in there is, um, again, what we saw when it was in place were two to three, sometimes four weeks, not not frequently. Usually it was one to two weeks, which kind of follows the pattern of the health guidance, which, um, you know, keeps kids out, you know, five, ten days, um, depending on the exposure and the, the circumstances around it. Um, and so centers don't, we never saw someone, you know, using up all their weeks at one time, um, but it does allow for it happened to that cycle to happen more than once with the eight weeks. Right. Um, that's okay. Um, of all the the list here, this one uh, has the most resistance, at least from the folks I work with. And at this point, I don't think I would be putting this on the list. Uh, it'll be in this in the house's version, I'm sure. Um, but I think it needs to be. Um, I'm just uncomfortable with uh, the way it seems kind of casual and. Um, and I would, I have questions about the interactions with the $20 million of emergency grants that have gone out to places. We have a $70 million package as well. Um, and I'm curious what this might cost. So just to tell the department and folks that this, I think, needs more work. Um, 
and so it doesn't mean it's not going to happen or in some form, but it means that it may not happen coming out of the Senate. So any questions from members? Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do I unmute my, com do I unmute my computer as well? I just want to make sure I'm right about yeah. that. Yeah, welcome to hybrid. It's so <laughs> weird. We did this this summer in frontline workers, but I, I just needed a little refresher, so I appreciate sure. it. And thanks for having me on the committee. Um, so this was something in place under the emergency powers um, in the beginning part of the pandemic. Is that right? Uh, Ms. Bosin. Yes, correct. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Senator Murphy. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, it, it would be helpful for me because I'm new. Um, if you could share with me a little bit more about what the heartburn is that you're hearing, just so I understand a little bit more about uh, the process that we're undertaking and what things will be moving forward and why things might not. Right. Um, and we have the luxury, Senator Murphy, and I'm really glad you're here. I'm uh, kind of excited about that prospect. And so we've been working together for a long time. And, and, um, and I, anyway, so that's going to be cool. Um, the... Uh, the child care arena has received a lot of influx of money over the whole COVID time. I can't tell you the total, but it's in the range of probably a half a billion or something. Um, so there's 300 million. Well, yeah, certainly it's, we did a half a billion just in the last bill. And, and so that money feels like rain falling from the sky, all the COVID money. And Minnesota, I guess, has gotten $65 billion dollars through counties, and we had 1.3 billion of our own last year in this uh, this very committee, and so, um, and it seems like that's created a casualness about money, and we're now, even though there's a surplus, I'm you'll, we can discuss is that surplus going to really happen or not? I'm insecure. I think it's insecure personally. We've been here long enough to see forecast change, and so we're now moving into the point that things are going to start costing real money again, and if there's any extra money left from COVID. Uh, for instance, in this bill, we have an emergency staffing pool uh, for group homes, which I see as a, like the most urgent crisis I can imagine. And we're going to try to find $4 million to pay for that. Um, and so as we just carefully parse through, this one seems to be the one I'm not even aware of how it would interact with the other large pots of money that are still out there, the $70 million in the emergency funding, the $20 million that the governor put out toward uh, other emergencies. And so... At the very least, I think it needs more discussion. And the way to create that discussion in a constructive way is to not put it in, and the House wants to talk about it. And then we can actually have that discussion and see if it really makes sense based upon the priorities that I see. Uh, that's my best thought for you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. So if I'm hearing you um, correctly, it is this is a question about spending and where we put our, our scarce resources even in this moment of surplus as you say and you know I share um, some of your concern about uh, what happens with the surplus and how we end up with deficits unfortunately if we're not careful um, the, the the part that I'm curious about and you know I, I am happy to be a part of a discussion going forward if this isn't included now is how to make sure but I would I hear the department suggesting that we allow especially small child care facilities to continue to receive funding if they have to close in the course of a quarantine. And I think about you know families and what they're dealing with and the unreliability right now of things like, are my kids in school or not? Are my kids in child care or not? Um, I want to understand the interaction of that experience with this proposal going forward. Right. So a, a how it works question rather than how do we pay for it question. Okay. Okay. I think both or I think we're kind of agreeing. <laughs> but I, we I will understand. See. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, cuz I, I don't think anybody can tell me uh, these places that closed from COVID for 2 weeks did they get this part of the 70 million already and then to give a blank appropriation coming out of I'm not even sure what the money source is on this. We'll have to ask, actually uh, the question I have leading up is the things that actually are going to cost money by extending it, how is that going to get paid for? Um, so that's, I think, a, a good discussion to have. And if you've, I don't know if you've followed all the hearings we had on childcare, it seems a little 
flexible. Um, and I, th I think the COVID, you know, it's, we're still in the middle of this mess. So how do we best be do good, good stewards of that? So not unfriendly to the topic. Um, okay, uh, Senator Wickland. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I don't have a question right now, but I guess if you are going to have more discussion about the topic, I'd um, like to be able to hear what the discussion is. And um, my perception is that that providers, you know, when they're forced to close, if they close and they lose the payments for the, that two week period, that that is an extreme burden that's placed on them. And uh, we want them to be able to um, survive and, and continue providing health care, um, you know, ongoing. And if they feel that they can't do that, um, you know, because they, they, if they close, they don't get paid, um, I think we'll run into having more situations where providers will decide that either they will close or, or permanently or they will maybe not take um, kids who have the C CCAP uh, subsidy and bring that to them. And we are, already have an issue for people, you know, families trying to find um, child care <coughs> providers who will take um, CCAP um, subsidies. So I think we should be focused on trying to make sure that we maintain um, those who are, are accepting the CCAP right now through this time of uncertainty where they have to deal with um, closing um, for the right reasons, which is to prevent transmission of a disease. Um, so I, I think, you know, it'd be helpful to know what the cost is, but I, I, I really support um, putting this back in place um, so that we can assure providers that they have the stability going through this. And if you think that the, the funds that we've received you know, that that is really um, causing providers to, to have um, really uh, much higher salaries and wages. Um, I guess we should, have a, we should talk about that too, because I don't, I think the subs or the, the amounts that they're getting per month are, are helpful to them and they're helping them, you know, get through um, difficult times, but we haven't fully addressed that childcare Reimbursement rates aren't where they should be at, and I think I would, I would say that I don't think this is going to, you know, this isn't going to bring them um, substantial sums that will make them um, be paid too much. So, uh, just wanted to make that comment and well, I hope that we can have more discussion in the committee if we're going to talk about this one further. So I Thanks. appreciate that, um, and maybe if we could set this topic aside for now. I do have one testifier that has to testify on the last section, uh, and you know we can just because I have some questions for Ms. Posine and maybe Senator Murphy Wadden. But this is exactly what the committee is for. That's what today is for. So whatever, then we can just move this off, and it may well be if um, if there's a disagreement on some of these elements, we'll actually have a real conference committee uh, and talk about that. And I would. Personally, hope that one of the two of you, Senator Murphy or Wickland, would be on that, you know, committee of three, and we could express thoughts. So, um, anyway, so if, if we can just put this aside for now, and I appreciate the discussion. So, let's, uh, why don't we just move to number four, uh, Mr. Burdick, because then we can have our time limited testifier talk, and then, um, so can you do that? Uh, certainly, Mr. Chair, we'll have Assistant Commissioner Dan Pollack speak to that. Okay. Mr. Pollack, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Dan Pollack, Assistant Commissioner for uh, Continued Care for Older Adults at DHS. Appreciate the committee's time. Um, this language may look familiar to you. This is a staffing pool that DHS started up with um, <clears throat> COVID relief fund dollars way back in uh, August 2020. Uh, the program for non-nursing home related emergencies, COVID staffing emergencies, ran for more than 12 months and then uh, was sunsetted and ended on December 31st, 2021. To restart the program with uh, a slightly different purpose, uh, really around staffing shortages like you alluded to with, with group homes and other home and community-based services providers right now, um, we are seeking um, temporary legislation just uh, to have the authority to do that and um, happy to provide more detail. 
I'll just sort of as commentary say that this is kind of like the um, spare tire. We drove on the spare tire for a year and maybe now we're buying a new spare tire, but it's still a spare tire. It's, it's not gonna help the car uh, go forever. <clears throat> Mr. Pollock, maybe it's somebody that stole the spare tire because it's not available anymore. So you have to put the old flat back on. Um, and can you answer a question, please, about the scope? And I, I mean, this is, I think, a really important thing. If I only did one, if, for my personal thing, we just did one thing, this is the one thing we have to do to keep group homes and others just, you know, functioning. Um, can you comment about the original executive order? Did it include all the facilities? listed after 4.18 all the way up to 5.15? Or is this an additional uh, group of people that could qualify? Mr. Chair, the um, in-scope providers are the same that uh, we allowed access to the, the COVID staffing pool um, during 2020 and 2021. Um, not, not all the staff went to all of these different provider types, but it was intentionally broad to give flexibility for right. just not knowing where the crisis might occur. So the scope is the same. This is not any additional places. That's group, correct, Mr. But Chair. group homes, assisted livings, and homeless shelters used it the most. Is that right? That's correct. And the providers are not required to use this. It's really an offer of support. It's uh, meant to be in lieu of the National Guard. So some of the providers that um, you know we worked with decided it really didn't work for them very well. You know, just uh, some of the specialization in terms of skill sets for who they would need for temporary staff. Um, some of these providers, it can get pretty complex. All right, well, I appreciate that. And I, we certainly agree this is something that we would like to do. Uh, Ms. Westrom? We're trying to make, uh, I know you have to get going, so do you have a chance to uh, give us your thoughts? Welcome. Thank you, Chair Abler, Vice Chair Benson, and members of the committee. My name is Liz Westrom, and I'm the Senior Director for Volunteers of American Minnesota Services for People with Special Needs. I have supported people with disabilities at VOA for over 10 years. We currently serve 110 Minnesotans in group homes in Ramsey, Benton, Mille Lacs, and Connecticut counties, and individuals living independently in those counties, as well as Morrison and Isanti counties. This work has always presented unique challenges, but the unyielding COVID pandemic and the staffing emergency we are facing is unlike any that we've ever known. Neither has gone away, no matter how hard and long we have wished and prayed for it. Just last Saturday, I spent the day as the single staff providing direct care to four amazing men in one of our Mora homes. Of the seven regular staff normally available to work at the site, four had contracted COVID within a six day time span. The remaining three staff and the regional manager worked night and day to cover the staffing needs for the week. And frankly, they all needed a break. With such small teams at each site, it doesn't take long to unravel from fully staffed down to 40% staffed. That's exactly what happened at the site. And unfortunately, staffing at other sites is also depleted. It leaves hundreds of open hours to manage each week. Being understaffed causes great stress in any industry. We see it every day in all sectors of business. Factor in difficult hiring environment that has been slowed by things like the challenging fingerprint process for applicants. Add on the 24 7 365 responsibility of the providers who do not have an option to close early or raise their rates to offer more attractive pay. While our current condition is precarious, there are opportunities that could make an immediate impact on our workforce. I am here to talk about a vital resource, an important safety net that disappeared at the end of December when it was announced that the emergency staffing pool was no longer being funded. I am here as an advocate and a constituent to request that you restore an emergency staffing pool for home and community-based service providers. The emergency staffing represented a lifeline to us, making it feel like we were not totally alone each approval from the state for emergency staffing brought a glimmer of hope for our exhausted staff, even if there may not have been somebody available to fill it. If we were lucky, a person arrived on site with some general caregiving experience, 
quickly trained the site-specific needs and filled in up to 40 hours in open shifts in locations that had COVID exposure of staff or residents. Last year, we requested the help of the emergency staffing pool 13 times to help get us through the 38 incidents of infections. The vendors were able to fill a little over 40% of the possible hours that were approved. Sometimes we were able to get help on site within 48 hours. Often it took up to a week, but every minute of coverage made a big impact on supporting the physical aspects of the job and lifting the morale and spirit of our team as well. It meant that we were not invisible and that our work is important, just like the hospitals and nursing homes. This also gave our crispy fried burned out staff a chance to get a small break as someone else helped fill open hours. It gave COVID infected staff some much needed time to rest and recuperate. You know, healthcare workers are now required to quarantine only for five days instead of 10 or 14. And while they can come back to work, they are not necessarily ready. Last month, we were happy to hire five new employees, but we saw six leave. Last year, we offered jobs to 117 people. Most bailed out quickly for higher paying jobs that they could start the next day. But 59 made it through the prolonged background process and came to orientation and training. This was still not enough to replace 67 people who left. Next week, we will be tackling our next pivot in managing the staffing needs at our sites. We will temporarily close one of our homes in Malacca and move the residents and staff to other locations to try to balance the boat so that we can remain afloat. The staffing vacancy rate at that site had reached 74% with the need for six additional full-time employees to fill the open shifts. The site is only the canary in the coal mine as staffing vacancies are present nearly everywhere. Volunteers of America is not alone in this workforce crisis. Across the state, many providers are turning away new referrals, closing programs, and delaying the launch of more integrated services due to insufficient staffing. Increased cost related to recruitment, training, staff overtime, supplies, and inflation cannot be sustained by community providers and nonprofits that are funded by a framework based on wage data that is two and a half years old. Providers in Minnesota are at a breaking point and people with disabilities and their families and advocates hang in the balance. I request that you act now respectfully. We can't wait until the end of the session. I greatly appreciate your time and the work that you are leading this session. Thank you for your continued support of disability services. Well, thank you, Ms. Westrom, and you've been eloquent, and I'm just sorry you have to say all those things you said. And um, this, this committee has been, and you know, a lot of us in the lot, but this committee has uh, been very interested and concerned about that, and I think universally, the membership, uh, it's not a partisan thing at all. It's like, how do we make this work? And we feel the crisis. We're moving this bill as our, at our first meeting, uh, trying to get there. The, I know the administration has been helpful with their technical advice on it. Um, and um, so we're going to try. Senator Murphy, did you want to say something? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm only going to say this one time, uh, so it's a blanket. I'm rusty at the subject matter here, um, and I missed a big chunk of uh, what we're experiencing right now. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, about this section and uh, its utility in this moment and its potential utility um, post-pandemic. And I'm wondering if Mr. Pollack might be able to um, shed a little light on the question of whether or not this is something we should consider in the future. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Ms. Westrom, thank you. I, you are, you're, you're free to go if you want, but I, would you please uh, make sure your workers know that, uh, about the tone that we're taking in this segment of the bill and the meetings we've had before and our deep concern with what's going to happen to their clients, which I know is what keeps you awake at night. 
Uh, but uh, this committee is committed to it. We're going to try to find a way to keep this pool open. It only uh, closed just because we didn't think we'd need it uh, in January. Like, oh. I mean, people thought, there were people that said COVID is going to last three months and be done. Do you remember that? Anyway, so thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Pollack, uh, you probably heard the question. Can you comment? Um, maybe, I mean, clearly, I think everybody agrees we need it now. And in the future, is this something that we should think about keeping? And uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Murphy, I, I think that's maybe a better question for the committee to decide. I mean, this is, um, this is really expensive and um, we're hiring vendor staff. I think the amendment that you have posted from the other body um, even is worried about how the vendors interact with our current providers. Um, the amendment actually creates a, a 30 day cooling off period that they don't want the vendors to be recruiting from any current provider within Minnesota. Um, so you have a, you know, a regional and a national kind of competition for workers right now. Um, Putting money into this kind of a program is um, a way to, to solve an emergency, maybe in a really short period of time. The, um, the, the language in front of you is, uh, you know, considering like a 21 day um, response, which really matches up, I think, in a fair way to what the National Guard is doing for, for some nursing homes right now. Um, but as ter in terms of a long term solution, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think this is the long-term solution. And I guess the only thing to think about for the long-term is like, do we want to have something like this forever the way we would have the fire department, but we don't want the fire department to be constantly driving around. I mean, it's, it really has to be limited and, and how do we avoid having to need this in the future? Senator Murphy. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Pollack. No, I think that's good. And I, um, I was actually unaware until you said it, we've, uh, we've, Senator, uh, Representative Schultz and I are do a conversation. Um, so, um, are there two pages to this amendment? Uh, on, on the 29H uh, 2914 A1-1 amendment. Oh, here it is. Um, um, so, that's, uh, I think that's a great idea to require a 30-day cooling off thing. Don't you, Senator Murphy, that they shouldn't be pirating from one home to go to another one. What's the current, is there a current, if this amendment doesn't pass, Mr. Pollock, what is the current um, what a poaching requirement? Is there, a, is there a, any rule against that? Uh, Mr. Chair, we are committed to using contract language to try to prevent the, the poaching. In particular, we would never want the vendor to be hiring anybody who's a current employee of the provider where they're operating. So we've, we've put that contract requirement in. If you wanna add that more specific, specificity into the law, then you know that, that will be a, a stricter requirement even than the contract. Um, because this basically says nobody in Minnesota who's worked in any of these providers in the last month is even eligible to be hired by the, by the staffing vendors. Um, I guess they could hire people from you know, other states or something or, or somebody who's 31 days off the job. Okay. Well, we're going to actually go through that amendment a little later, but this is enlightening. Uh, and so this is not as bad as the uh, nursing thing where we're paying $275 an hour and giving them $345 per diems, right? We're not paying those levels, Mr. Pollock, or are we? Uh, Mr. Chair, no. That program that you're alluding to um, is a national vendor that um, I believe is working under MDH contract specifically in hospitals. And, um, you know, that was really, uh, I think, executed in consideration of a hospital collapse from Omicron surge. So that, that yeah. is acute care only. All right. That just, that just seems to upset the whole balance of nature, Senator Murphy. Or, don't you think? I mean, how do you bargain for that. If, uh, Senator uh, Hoffman. So, you know, one of the things that prompted uh, uh, the question to you, Chair, is when uh, Dan Pollock had talked about, yeah, this is a, not a long-term fix. It's, you know, it can be a short-term piece. And, and I guess the question back to the Assistant Commissioner is, are you also taking a, a global look at, you know, some of our ratio concerns that we have? Why are we so stuck on a one to three, one to four, one to five, one to six? 
you know, those risk management type discussions are the, I mean, now's the time to have that conversation. If we know the system is not going to make it because of the fact that we're never going to be able to pay, then I sent that, yeah. that picture. McDonald's in Burnsville starting at 21 bucks an hour, right? I mean, you know, how much is it going to cost us to get to $20 an hour in rate, rate methodology, oh, no. right? I mean, it's a... This is now the time to have that conversation. So, Dan, I guess, are you guys having that internally, the conversation about how do we change our, our way of practice so that we're not, you know, having some liability concerns or risk management side of it? Is that, I guess, if the question needs to be answered later in, in line. If you don't know the answer, that's fine. But I think it, it behooves the, the, the department to actually go back and look at our practices now. What can change in this? Right, Mr. Pollack. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, I think those are uh, those are healthy questions. I, my expectation is that the bill in front of you today would buy it, the legislature some time to have those conversations in the 2022 session. Think about what would be a good idea. I know there are providers out there who are calling that question. Um, I believe Arc of Minnesota made some announcement recently, but um, yeah, I definitely want to give you guys the time and space to, to do that as the legislature. What announcement did Arc make? That they were looking, trying to look at keeping people living somewhere, make a flexibility kind of announcement. Or I know the letter they put out in December had a flexibility flavor to it, Mr. Paul. Uh, so Mr. Mr. Chair, I might I might phone a friend on this one. I believe um, Arc of Minnesota has been um, sort of asking whether the the four person group home model has uh, solvency going forward. Okay, and we're going to be discussing that a lot more. So. Um, anyway, well, um, well, this is interesting. Um, so, alrighty. So, any other questions about this section? This is a pretty good meaty discussion for the first day, uh, Mr. Pollock do, or Mr. Pollock, uh, Mr. Burdick. Do you want to go back to um, section three? Then I guess it is. Uh, certainly, Mr. Chair. Also, wanted to see we could get into a little bit of the conversation we were having around the cost of the. Child care provision in section two. I believe there isn't a cost to that. So yeah, we'll come back to that. We're, we're just we're putting the whole section okay. two on hold for the moment, and we're going to go through all our work and then come back and sort yeah, through that. I love this. We're actually going to Sounds good, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Well, then I will turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Moti, um, to talk about section three. Thank you. Section three. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Again, my name is Kalani Moti, and I serve as the Inspector General at DHS. And section three is um, about the um, distribution and staffing ratios related to child care um, to child care. So what, would, what the waivers would be reenacting would be staff distribution requirements would be temporarily suspended through the end of June. And the child care um, and it would require that child care, excuse me, let me try that sentence again. It would. Um, require the child care centers to have a teacher qualified professional on site at all times the children are being cared for. And that would differ from the current requirement that's in um, statute that of having a teacher in each group of children. And then also the next change would be that there must be one person of at least 18 years of age with each group of children. And that the minimum staff to child ratio would still need to be maintained but it would be a change from what is currently required in needing to have a teacher or an assistant teacher or an aide depending on size for each group. So it allows just for a little bit more flexibility for some of the distributions and the ratios while still um, allowing for the requirements for health and safety. So is there any questions? Well, thank you. And um, so, I appreciate the flexibility, and so this is exactly the kind of thing that we've been talking about. If it's if it's good for COVID and people are safe and and thriving ostensibly or presumably, uh, are you considering why would we not just keep doing this? Since the childcare folks tell me they can't get enough staff Thank you. anyway, um, is this a? Are you rethinking? Is there going to be a department proposal that that? revisit some of these very things and maybe permanentizes this one? Ms. Modi. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am I know we have been asked to really look at what we specifically would need through the end of June. I, um, um, I know we're always taking a look at where we can make improvements and where we can suggest 
um, things can be different um, on that. And so um, always taking that under advisement, I'm not sure if we're prepared to bring anything in this session, though. All right. Well, anything I will defer that to Matt, Mr. Burdick. Senator Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, it's funny because I just leaned over to Senator Utke and I'm like, that doesn't give him much time, only four, four or five months, actually, June, yeah. you know, the end of June 2022. And we know that the, I could name all the child care providers. I'll start with Champlin Park, you know. I'll start with Primrose. I'll start going down the line. And they well, exactly what you that? said. I suggest that. Before that, we wrap up, I think we're going to suggest, we're going to go through section by section and yeah. see where we think we're going to go with each one. So I think it needs to be extended. Time. Mr. Chair, I think it needs to be extended to really give the... I, I bet that would pass. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Senator Murphy, you're looking thoughtful there. It's amazing you think I'm looking thoughtful with this mask <laughs> on my face. Appreciate that. Uh, my one question for the department is, uh, since this would be an extension of what has already occurred, um, is there any information uh, or evaluative data um, that you could share with us about how this has worked in the past? Ms. Modi, is this you or do you need to phone a friend? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Murphy. I don't have that available today, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that today, but we'll be able to provide if we have that information to you as soon as possible. Okay, Senator Murphy. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and I would appreciate that, especially if there's contemplation of a continuation of this going forward. It'd be good to know what the impact is. Right, and uh, Senator Murphy, for my money, it seems like we would extend it to a finite time, just more than six months, and then just, anyway. So, um, any other questions on this section? All right, um, Senator Utke. Uh, so this is, this is the body of all the, Mr. Burdick, we've completed all the ones you brought to us, right? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Chair. There is one in the amendment that the other body had that I believe. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's talk about that. Was that the county thing? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, that's yeah. on my list. Mr. Burdick, why don't you, who's going to talk about that, please? And we have a testifier, too. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe there's a testifier from the county present. Oh, okay. Let's, uh, Ms. Hennon, do you want to just talk about that, please? Welcome to the committee. Oh. And if you can tell us uh, what page and line it is, uh, do you have that amendment in front of you or do you just know the topic? I'm sorry, Chair, I don't have an amendment in front of me. I don't know what page and line it is. Okay. Mr. Uh, Yates, can you just want to, can you tell us, do you know what section we're talking about? Or Mr. Burdick, go ahead, Mr. Yates. Uh, Yep, Mr. Chair, um, Mr. on the amendment document on, on the A1-1, it is on line 1.8 to 1.10, and uh, oh. the COVID waiver number that we use is CV11. Okay. Well, there you go. Good to have friends around, Ms. Hennon. So go ahead and tell us why this is a good idea, please. Good afternoon, Chair Abler, committee members. My name is Stacey Hennon, uh, and I'm the Western Prairie Human Services Director, which serves Grant and Pope Counties and also the Traverse County Social Services Director. I'm here today representing MAXA, the Minnesota Association of County Social Services Administrators. Um, so as we've all known, as we all know, the pandemic has impacted all Minnesotans, but perhaps none have been hit harder than our state's most vulnerable populations. Uh, counties continue to work hard to respond to the demands of a shifting pandemic climate to ensure that the service delays and interruptions are minimized during this time. There are many face-to-face -face visits that we do regularly um, and did so when the waivers were in place. We believe face-to-face -face should continue to be the standard when possible. Counties recognize their responsibility for children, particularly for children in placements, since CV11 addresses that, and we take that seriously. Um, peacetime emergency waivers and modifications issued by DHS and in effect until July of 2021 permitted county staff to continue the delivery of services without sacrificing service quality by seeing foster kids remotely when physical health prevented us from seeing them in person. Um, the reason I'm here today is to, before you today, is to recognize and thank you for recommending a series of waivers be reinstating, reinstated, including the amendment to include CV11 in this package. Waiver CV11 allows for caseworkers to conduct the federally required monthly visits with children in placement virtually, whether by phone or video conference, when the safety of the child is not due to the placement itself. So when safety isn't a concern, 
Um, and it's really a health concern. We, we're allowed to do that. We recognize the value of face-to-face -face contact with the children we have in placement and are suggesting this when necessary and appropriate, not all the time. Uh, we want to offer our support of this amendment in the limited and temporary situations described. Uh, and thank you for your time. And we're here to answer questions, too, if you have any. Well, and thanks, um, Ms. Ms. Hennon. I appreciate you coming forward. And so compared to the previous one that we might think to, should last longer with the flexibility, this is something, this is definitely just related to the health crisis. And your preference is that these would all be in person uh, as a best practice. But to be realistic, uh, the flexibility needs to be there. Does that summarize what you said? That's correct, Chair Abler. We recognize that it's best practice to, to, to see kids in person. We think that that's, that's what we would prefer to do in, in most of the time, the best of times. There are times where it's not possible because kids are quarantined, homes are quarantined, right. schools are quarantined, or, or our staff are. We just are limited in staffing. So we, we're asking for it to be in situations like that only. Okay. Any questions about this? And do you know the duration of this particular one? Is this through June or does this go past? Or is this tied to the federal emergency? I guess that's a question I'm going to We're going to go back and revisit each of these. But um, uh, Mr. Burdick, do you know how long this one would last? Sure. Senator Aki. Yeah, and if Mr. Burdick uh, weighs in differently, that's, that's fine. But looking under all the other um, you know, back in section one, all the waivers, at the end of that, they have them all on September 1 of this year. So would this just fall in that same group because it's the waiver? You know, that you've got from CVO 3 on up to uh, 89, you know, they jump around. This falls right in there. Now, these are all, I, Mr. Burdick, why don't you comment, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. This would expire on June 30th of 2022. There are several waivers that are actually retroactive back to September 1st of this year, or of last year, excuse me. That, th this is not one of those. And then there are a few that are extended to align with the federal timeline. But this one would expire um, June 30th of 2022. Senator, okay. And so, Mr. Burdick, uh, Clause 4, which is the uh, tele telehealth stuff, that's for people that did it and didn't get paid. Now they can get paid. Is that the point of that? Oh, they, like the Mr. retroactive, Chair, the retroactive effective date for CB 53. Um, that's Mr. Chair, that's correct. We're trying to not penalize people that have been doing okay. things to protect the health and safety of clients during this time. Okay. So, uh, when we complete the topics, we're taking up two more topics. Um, any questions about this one? Okay, we're good in that one, seems like. Uh, we're going to take up two more topics, and then Mr. Burdick, um, I'm going to ask you to talk about the cost, or send somebody talked about the cost of each of these sections. And then at the last point, we're going to go through and just look at each section, talk about effective dates, and see what we think about the House Amendment. So that'll be good committee work. Um, so Senator Utke, Task Force on Subminimum Wage, the uh, A2 Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, again, we're just presenting today. We'll have to actually vote on these next week, right? Yeah, and Mr. Monahan, or whoever, our, I guess it's going to fall on you. My intention is to have a delete all, one amendment with all the stuff in that we've decided we're going to send out in the Senate. So on Tuesday, we won't do six amendments. It's just going to be one big one. And it's my hope that this can be in that. But so, Senator Aki. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, uh, for. Everyone who's got a copy, it's the A2 amendment, and this uh, talks about the sub-minimum wage um, legislation, the language that was passed this past, uh, I believe, first couple days of uh, July even, end of session, a special session. And anyhow, we've had a lot of conversations or uh, interim hearings related to what was passed and what we would like it to read or how the, the changes we'd like to see. And so with this uh, amendment that we're looking at, uh, you'll notice that we try to get rid of all the language, or most of it related to eliminating the sub-minimum wage and having the conversation around, around promoting independence and increase the opportunities for people with disabilities 
to earn the competitive wage. Um, we know that some people need the subminimum wage just because of their capabilities. They love their job. They love what they do. They like working with their friends. This would eliminate those jobs. And we've been given different numbers um, up to possibly 7,000 Minnesotans fall under this category. And we want to make sure we do everything we can to maintain the jobs that they had, um, which does lead to the independence because that's what they've asked us for. They like their job and they want to keep it. At the same time, we want the facilities to look at each individual and promote their opportunities. Um, in the end, if they're able to um, move on to an independent job, get into the uh, higher wages, of course we all want that. But we're with this, we're trying to maintain um, the, the 14C, which uh, speaks to the subminimum wage uh, employment for those that desire it and fall into that category. And you'll see, uh, kind of starting, uh, we also made a little change to the task force, um, increasing the task force member number from 16 to 20, which, uh, you know, in here it'll show uh, we added one more person, um, and hopefully it's a, you know, pointing out the fact that, that we'd like a person that's actually being paid the sub-minimum wage, and then there's uh, three members that are parents, guardians, uh, you know, people associated with uh, these individuals. Um, but beyond that, most of this just relies around it's, I would call it softening the language, because uh, you know, everybody that's listened to any of our hearings all along is, I've been adamantly against the elimination because we have people that uh, truly desire and want to work in these jobs. Um, and they just aren't capable of doing enough to get paid minimum wage, which means their job would be eliminated and now it would be basically an adult daycare, and they want more than that. Even if they're able to do just minimal things, that gives them pride in what they do, and we want to make sure that we uh, do everything we can to help those people out and keep them working. Um, that's what they're asking us to do. So that's why you see this amendment. Um, it makes modifications to what was recently passed, and. Uh, it's a study group, but we want to be a step ahead. We want to be talking this way versus the way that um, group was, it, what was laid out. And, you know, frankly, the people that signed up to uh, participate in it were asked to basically, um, I guess, that sign that they were in agreement with eliminating the subminimum wage. And I don't agree with that. And that's why we've been having all these conversations over the last number of months, and now this is an amendment that hopefully we can accomplish that. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thanks, Senator Uckey, and you know, this is a, a real important topic. And part of the concern that brought this forward was the concern that the feds would just say, you can't do it anymore, and so to be prepared, we wanted to be prepared. Uh, we would have to have done a state workaround with state-only funds for some of these individuals that this is their highest and best place to go to have an opportunity to work uh, in the capacities that are in the subminimum wage category. So um, I, I think it's a good idea. Senator Fate. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to speak out against uh, including this. Um, we did this intentionally. We included this with the goal of eventually phasing out and eliminating the subminimum wage. Also, from what my understanding is, um, DHS requires um, folks that are part of the task force to agree that this is the goal, the ultimate goal of eliminating the subminimum wage. So we have, to, we have a contractual obligation also uh, to consider because that is the ultimate goal. And for everyone that's also listening on the Zoom, um, the entire premise of the subminimum wage is that certain folks don't deserve uh, an equal wage because they have a disability. And what we did is we got together to make sure that we address that, uh, that fundamental inequality. So what this task force is doing is working on, um, while addressing the concerns of the business community, 
um, ensuring that our siblings in the disability community have an equal wage or have the opportunity to earn an equal wage, but also we don't have a system in which uh, folks that um, folks don't have equal rights because they have a disability. And this was worked uh, hard on and by many uh, disability advocates, not just last year, but uh, for the last few years. And they took into consideration the, the, the concerns that Senator Arki just brought up right now, but also on the House side. And because of that, because of those concerns, uh, we didn't, we didn't um, give them their first ask, their initial ask, which was the elimination of the subminimum wage. We came back and we compromised on having a task force with the end goal of doing that. And I say that by, by doing this, we will be completely betraying uh, the folks, the advocates that have been working hard on this, specifically from the disability community, folks like our friend Noah McCourt, who have been working on this for the last few years. And I really don't think that this is the right way. I think that we should be moving forward and not backward and keeping this, um, our, keeping our promise to the folks that worked hard on this. Thank you. Other, Senator Aki. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And my question that I would like to ask of the group and whoever is behind that, what a, you know, what are we going to do for the people that are currently working in the subminimum wages? That job is not going to exist. It's going to go away. They are not going to have employment and get the things out of life that they're, they're, you know, appreciating right now. Um, I've had a number of the people that work sub-minimum wage, you know, reach out and saying, you know, do everything you can to protect my job. I love my job. I love my friends. Um, they, it's going to go away. There's no, it's just a matter of economics. If the person is only getting, I'll just use a dollar an hour or whatever, because their output is extremely minimal, and you're going to bump them up to minimum wage, the facilities can't pay it. Their, their job is gone, and they don't want to have that job go away. So, I mean, we have to address their needs and talk about their needs and their requests. Um, so that's all I'm asking from the committee. They can, or that whoever put this together, bring forth those, uh, um, th that type of information. But I would like to hear from those that actually, and I have heard from those that are working the subminimum wage and the only thing they say is, I love my job and do not take it away. Senator Fateh. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Arki. Um, but the concerns that uh, Senator Arki laid out right now is the exact reason why we didn't go forward with eliminating the subminimum wage and why we have a task force to do so. Their job is to take the concerns of the business community, take the concerns of everyone, and come up with a solution that'll fit both folks that have a disability, but also how we can preserve these jobs and help these businesses also. That's the entire point of having this task force. So I say that we should keep our trust in this task force and not uh, weaken it. Actually, it's not even weakening it, it's destroying it, in my opinion. So I say we should move forward the way it is. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Oh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's the whole debate that we uh, entered into this whole last year. And when, when it was originally, we go back, I, we'll talk some more offline too. I mean, the history of this goes way back 100 plus years. I mean, we're Dr. Colleen Wick talking about the, the potato fields, you know, in the state institutions and how it was getting the Department of Labor to give a, you know, a special men certificate so somebody could do what they want to do. And as organizations started to get rid of their 14C certificate, they started to realize that they could figure out how to get um, work outside of the special men certificate. And when you look at it from the task force, and I spent the last year, uh, Senator Fate, on, on the task force, right? I mean, it was, that's exactly what you're bringing up and what Senator Aki's bringing up. That's, didn't it sound like we were just having that conversation? And, and there was, where was the copper? by the way. You're on mute, it says. Oh, yeah. no, I, I'm on mute on the thingy, but people can hear. I'm a, I'm a Luddite. I, you know, I just, it just uh, but I did know that thing. So it's just, a, um, of course, people probably don't want to hear me right now. I'm going to give a history lesson here. So I'm kidding. I won't. 
But to your point, here's, here's the debate. Um, you're right. The advocates years ago wanted to bring this, right? And, and even federally there was. And then there was this, this wave of federal interest saying, we are going to, it became a priority from a lot of congressional leaders saying, we're going to eliminate 14C, right? And they were just going to push it to the states. Well, like good federal law does, they just push it to the states. And so our response was, well, let's put this task force together. To, to phase this conversation, to look at phasing this thing out. Well, the word phase out, right, became eliminate for some reason. So the due diligence that, that the committee was doing and started to have this conflict between those advocates that said they wanted one thing and yet at the same time, you have programs that are out in the middle of nowhere. It's all they have out there, right? And so it was a one size fits all approach and it was really, no, let's let the task force go back to, to have the conversation, but try to get rid of that conversation of, you know, for some reason, the narrative was going to eliminate, right? Ultimately, what you're going to see, I believe 75% of the programs that are providing those types of services have all gotten rid of their 14C certificate. Christy Grom has the actual number. I just have the top of my head, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I remember it was a lot of people that have eventually processed their way out of it. And, and the whole piece why we originally wanted to say, well, let's put a, a task force together and see about taking some time on this and put some money in it, was to try to help provide technical assistance to people that would say, well, this is how you can do it, how you can't do it. But there was one thing missing. Unique and individualized needs, individualized consent, individualized informed choice was missing in this conversation. If I live out in Bertha, Minnesota, and I have X, Y, and Z, and I am getting my socialization, or I want to do it, I choose, Senator Rutke, if, if I choose individually, and it's, and it's clearly written in my IDT plan, my service agreement, and I choose that I want to go to this organization and be part of this program, because like you said, there's socialization, there's other things in there, and if I choose, unequivocally, my informed choice, which by the way, Donovan Frank, a federal judge, has put in you know, written language in Minnesota, informed choice, jets and settlement, everything you go, it's always the word informed choice in there, right? If I choose that, then so be it. Then we shouldn't, um, and this was our conversation, Senator Fate, was how, how do you say, well, it's okay, your informed choice, but no, we're not gonna do that anyway. So what Senator Utke is saying, let's build this task force out, Let's slow down the, the conversation and allow for that informed choice piece, which I think informed choice is more a legal definition that should be coming into play anyway. So if I choose that. So you're exactly, you're hitting it right on the nail, Fate, on, on the conversation we just spent the whole year going back and forth on. So I think if you have some other language to add in there, Senator um, Utke's compromise looks good because it keeps the task force in, in order and it gets us toward that end goal. And I just want to say, when you get polarized conversations, you got advocates saying, I want it right now, all, all or none kind of thing, and you got folks saying, well, what about this? I think this is a good compromise on that. But if, you have, if there's some wordsmithing that goes, I mean, let's, uh, let's bring it next week, um, you know, because we're not going to take this up till next week. I hope what, I'm, what I just said makes sense regarding the process, Senator Abel, and, I, and if I don't, I apologize, but informed choice must be brought into this whole conversation the whole time. And I think this compromise might get us there. And if it's missing a, a, some language, it might bring it, bring it all, right? Let me offer a suggestion. Um, if, if this discussion should be had at all in the legislature, it will be had by an amendment of the sort of the amendment Senator Aki has brought forward. The House is silent on this. And so, uh, at least this gives it a chance to have a dialogue. And Senator Fate, I appreciate your passion. I know Mr. McCourt, and I'm, I'm not far away from the things you have said, um, very frankly, nor is Senator Hoffman or Senator Aki. Um, these are not meant to be, you know, people working in just untorable circumstances, but um, there's some people for whom this is the only thing that that there's around for them to even do. And so what happens then? So, uh, so, um, I, uh, we've done more committee work at this committee today than a lot of committees have done in a whole session, just in terms of talking about things. So, um, and so I'll just tell you what I'm intending to do. That, that was, this would be in the amendment if there's some, um, but the House is silent on this and they're, that, they're not gonna accept this without a discussion anyway. 
So in the same way we're going to talk about child care, I think talking about this sub-minimum wage is healthy. Not to coerce you about anything, but I, I, I don't think that I don't want to hear your voice. I absolutely think that's important. And so um, just so you know, so and we don't have to quit it. We're not quitting at 2.30. So if you want to discuss this more today, we can. Um, Tuesday is not the day for that discussion because I want to honor the governor's budget to have all their time for all that discussion. Uh, so the time for discussion is today and behind the scenes with Representative Schultz and the House and what we can come to do to uh, address this in a, the most appropriate way. The, the, just so you know, this task force happened in the light of day behind every closed door. It wasn't a dark night. It's no smoke-filled rooms. Um, but it happened in a vacuum. We were not in a position that the public could come like they could come today and say, what do you think? Um, it happened. It was well-intended. Uh, I think it could have been done a little more focused and clear. Um, so anyway, so that's the discussion I would encourage, and I will absolutely be responsive to that. Senator Fate, does that sound like a reasonable plan? OK, I got a thumbs up over there. Senator, oh, Senator Wickland, yeah, sorry. Uh, welcome. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a um, comment. I, I don't support this amendment in its form it is right now, and I have concerns about having a discussion today and, and then not having a chance to hear from um, those who have worked on this, um, this topic um, who might have a different opinion from um, Senator Atkey, and we don't have stakeholders here. If this is the day that we were supposed to be able to discuss and hear um, from people who might have a different opinion on Senator Atkey's language, um, I, I just wonder if they're here um, and if they can tell us why, um, you know, why they wouldn't support this um, language. And um, it doesn't seem like a you know, a mild change to the task force, and I think the task force should be able to continue the way it was written um, and discussed last year. Uh, but I think we're missing, if, if that is the point today, to have discussion and hear from people who might, um, might have put a lot more time into this, um, their reaction to this language. Um, I'm wondering if they're able to, to speak well, thank you, and thanks, Senator Wicklund, for that uh, observation. However, I just want to remind you, uh, this committee had six interim hearings, and we're trying to decide if we heard this two or three times, at, at three times. Senator Hoffman says three times this topic was brought up. We set up a work group to engage with stakeholders and whomever, and this is um, what came out of that. And did we float a draft this summer? Did we float this draft? Yeah. Yes. And this, and this draft was floated in November, just so in terms of process. And so we're not trying to be clever. Um, but I, I appreciate your comments, Senator Wickton, and I appreciate that you can maybe help uh, with uh, further discussion about it. But it's, you can respond, Senator Wickton, if you like. Well, I, I, I guess, did people know that today was going to be the day that they're going to talk about um, an amendment that could be adopted and actually added to a bill? that is going to move forward. So, I mean, that's different than having discussions during interim. Um, I guess I don't know if they were notified or not about today's hearing and the, and the amendment. I'm just right. saying that I don't hear them or I don't see them, and it seems like people have a strong opinion about this, that they would be here today if, if they wanted to, come, you know, if they knew that we were going to take action on an amendment. Yeah, I respect that. Um, and as you know, in committee, anybody can bring any amendment whenever they want. And so the House, the House, whoever, um, we're, we're bringing forward the House amendment that, you know, it just it's, it's a process. I think that there's ample time for that discussion. So um, hopefully we can respect all those voices and, and yours, you know, in particular. So um, anybody else on this topic for now? I think this is a good discussion, and I don't consider the matter settled. So. Um, anyway, so that's that. Um, Alrighty, uh, one more topic which um, was also not noticed. Um, there's a on the, um, but it's 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 important, and I don't believe it's controversial. Uh, in your uh, attachments, you have a, a memo entitled SC 8736, 
which is temporary remote delivery of qualified professional services. Um, I believe this was in the governor's list of things that we were to do, as I believe. Uh, Mr. Hancox is here. Um, David, are you there? We can maybe just take it from there and then we can see what people think about this one. And I, if we can get agreement on this, uh, I'm inclined to want to put it in and then see if the House is willing to consider it. It seems like a really important COVID-related thing. But Mr. Hancox, I'll leave that explanation to you. Thank you. And then I'm interested to hear what the, then just so the department can be on notice, I'd like to have them react as well. So, Mr. Hancox. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak to the issue of temporary continuation of remote-only QP visits. Um, at your request, I will try to be very brief in my comments. First, I want to acknowledge Ms. Grom's earlier comments that the current DHS policy does allow for flexibility in QP visits. However, as Mr. Herdick also noted, COVID-19 continues to present numerous challenges so very many of which uh, relate to the health and safety of individuals. So ACRA supports a temporary continuation of remote-only QP visits for several reasons. First, remote-only visits better protect the health and safety of both the clients that we support in their homes, as well as the QP staff of ACRA and other service providers. Second, it better assures the continuation and minimizes the potential interruption of effective and efficient QP visit responsibilities. Third, it allows for timely completion of those QP visits. And fourth and finally, it provides QP visits in a potentially cost-effective manner. So for these reasons and others that we could potentially discuss, uh, APRA again supports this temporary continuation of remote-only QP visits. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank, thank you, you again. For yeah, opportunity. thanks, nice to see you again. And you know, you're, too, a, you're an example of why I, I don't believe in reincarnation except in the, this arena that we're in because you've been many things in my past. So and I'm glad you've landed Thanks. where you are doing good work there, Mr. Hancox. Uh, Ms. Grom, uh, can you, uh, you, you have a comment, I think, and um, is this perhaps part of CB 53 on page two or is this wholly different? So, Ms. Grom. Mr. Uh, Chair, members, uh, thank you. So I, I've reviewed this language a few times um, and appreciate the, the thought behind it. Um, we've looked at it, we don't have any concerns with the kind of the technical construction of it, but it's really unnecessary. It's, we, we don't need to add this additional language just for, just for this um, particular COVID waiver. And in fact, we can just manage this through our guidance. Um, people already have, have the right to say, I want an in-person qualified professional visit. They can call up their agency. They can call up their worker and already request that. That's not something that um, we could we could deny someone. So um, there's already the flexibility and the option for people to be able to kind of make the choice of what's best for them. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And is that different, Ms. Grom, than the one uh, than line 2.3, or if that's the right line number uh, in C in clause four? Um, is that different? Just tell me if it's way different that I won't ask more than that. Mr. Chair and members, I, I do think it's different. I think that this is the line 2.3 is specifically, beginning at line 2.3 is specifically allowing for um, that remote option for qualified professional, whereas this language, the way I read it, and I don't have it in front of me right now, I apologize, but is um, um, putting some parameters around that and just saying that people, if, if they want an a in-person visit, that they can request one. Um, and that's possible already and, and required under law. So we just, it's just not necessary language. They, I Thank believe you. they are different. Okay, well, I appreciate them. I'm glad they're different. Uh, we'll have to do the never mind thing. Uh, Mr. Hancox, uh, can you comment about what you see about the flexibility that is uh, available and are, are your folks aware of that? And um, can you comment on just I want to get a little discussion going here, please? Uh, yes, sir. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. The we do recognize that the current policy of DHS does allow for that flexibility. What we're hoping to uh, accomplish is a temporary return to the remote only QP visits uh, again to address the health, health and safety issues that we've heard both from our staff as well as from our clients and for the other reasons that I already identified. I 
but um, and I have had conversations with Ms. Crum about this, and we understand the, the separate positions here, and, and I respect that. Our intent is to at least return to a temporary remote only QP visit. All right. Um, and how, um, so, um, all right, so, uh, and th I mean, this is a vehicle to do some of these things that are kind of without controversy. Uh, do any members in the committee sense a controversy about this? Any concern? I have a lot of confidence in both of the people who testified just now. Um, uh, well, and Mr. Chair, if I Mr. might Hancock. add, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, pardon me for interrupting you. We're not in, uh, we're not in conflict with Ms. Grom's position either. We understand it and we do recognize that it does provide a great degree of flexibility. We just want to make sure that we have that the flexibility, the flexibility includes uh, a temporary remote only. So I don't know if that helps clarify. Or not. And Mr. Hancock, if a Thank person you, Mr. under this, if, if this big passes, if a person wanted an in-person visit, could they get one? Mr. Hancock's? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, they certainly could. They would, all they would have to do is request that in-person visit as Ms. Grom already noted. All right. So well, yes. this, is, this is my inclination. We have two other sections that are gonna be certainly discussion points. Um, this bill will attract some interest. If it's okay with the committee, I'd like to include this and see what the pushback is from anybody, um, given that this is the only ship that's gonna be sailing for that. So, um, okay. Is it going to be included as a like standalone, or are you going to put it in with like It'll the, be in the, the department? Okay, the Toledo. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, so we've, I think, is anything else anybody wanted to try to put into this? And I realize I didn't ask anybody that but before, so. But if Senator Hoffman has 16 amendments to offer. Okay, so if we could go through, uh, the next thing I'd like to go through is the Senate, or the House amendment. Uh, Mr. Burdick, can you, I don't know, could you walk us through this? I don't think we have any staff that's knowledgeable about this. Um, and I mean, they're knowledgeable and they could have studied it, but they didn't have that opportunity. Um, so um, where we can align and be nice to, um, although given that we're gonna have a dialogue, it doesn't really matter. Um, I do, especially when I discuss the 120 bit about the 30 days, I really like that part. Um, short of that, Mr. Burdick, um, this bill is not going to go to the governor the way it is. I have a feeling since there'll be some discussions. Uh, is there any part of this amendment that it would be useful to adopt? Um, we're already in, very interested in lines 1.3 to 1.6. Uh, certainly, Mr. Chair, um, I can walk through some of the changes here. Line 1.2, and I believe that is also repeated on line 1.15. This is really just trying to tighten up the language to make sure that we're clear that only the waivers that are specifically delineated in the bill can be revised and that you're right. not returning to the commissioner the broad flexibilities that we have. Right. And as much as we might appreciate those, I think you're the... Oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, hey, that's, that's funny. Um, so I think nobody minds line 1.2, just <laughs> clarifying. Okay. I think, do we agree we like the, uh, the county? No. Oh, no, it's in the number 110 is the, the dates. Let's talk about dates. So, um, certainly, Mr. Chair. Let's uh, just kind of go from the beginning to the end on dates. So, we already talked about the first section, section one being June 30th. Um, and then. And, Mr. Chair, lines 1.3 to 1.6, those align the uh, first two waivers under section one relating to the um, signatures for economic assistance programs, and those sync up our state programs with the um, federal uh, SNAP programs to make sure that both timelines are all consistent. And we probably like that, right? Senator Murphy, you like that, I bet. Aligning. All those in favor of aligning? Okay. Uh, fine. Um, and so see, and then 1.8 to 1.10, we're all comfortable with that. Okay. So Mr. Burdick, uh, and then uh, we don't mind renumbering. We just did a whole bill on renumbering, so I, we should... Uh, Certainly, nobody minds 111. So 112, uh, is that, so if you want to just kind of walk through here, Mr. Burdick. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Uh, slide 1.12, this is a technical change, just um, making sure we have accurate terminology in the bill. Okay. 113. And then line 1.13, this is uh, clarifying that both uh, 
of the provisions that Ms. Grom spoke about are retroactive back to September 1st. Okay. Anybody mind that? And that? Retro. Okay, we're a retro group, Mr. Burdick. Keep going. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then line 1.15 is the continuation that I talked about of tightening up the language uh, oh, yeah. for that section. Perfect. And then I believe the, re the remainder of the amendment are changes to the uh, emergency staffing pool, including the provision you discussed about the cooling off period. But I defer to Mr. Pollack to get into any um, ah. substantive details. Also. So that's all the rest. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any concerns about incorporating, I guess, this entire amendment into our Senate position? All right. So, Mr. Monahan, that's your instruction, I guess. Um, let's see. So, we have to talk about child care still. What have I forgotten? Is that what's left? So, we've. Okay, let's. Uh, Okay, we're going to revert. So that we've at least we understand what the amendment is going to be. Anybody not clear about what it's going to look like? Okay. Um, good. So, Ms. Posteen, welcome back. And uh, you know, we'll, I don't think we should go past three, um, but at least if we can just have a little discussion, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and I'm going to go to Senator Murphy and then Senator Wickland and to make sure they get their questions in. Uh, can you tell me how many uh, centers, are these both homes and centers, uh, how many places um, have, a, have used this uh, flexibility uh, so far since we opened it up? When, when did this start? Was this a 2020 thing? Ms. Posteen, welcome. So yeah, who's used it and both centers and Homes, I suppose. Ms. Summerfeld, whoa. All right, Mr. Chair, I, I think um, Ms. Hussine is having some technical difficulties, so I will just try to get her up in a second. Oh, okay. Do you know the answers to those questions? I do not have the answer to that question. <laughs> All right. You're just like the, the, the call waiting music waiting for us here. Okay. Yep, I'm your receptionist, so hold on. <laughs> That's funny. You're much more than that, Ms. Summerfield. Yeah, you're, Ms. Posseen is neither unmuted nor on mic. So. so, Mr. Chair, my apologies. I don't know if we're going to be able to get Lori up right this second. Um, can we take that question back um, and get back to you on it? Yes. Um, Thank you. And then, so, I mean, this. I hope, anyway, so I'm, this is at a discussion point which needs to be resolved. So, Senator Murphy, do you want to add more questions for that? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as we discussed earlier, um, I'm, I am interested from the department to understand the impact that the the policy that was put in place temporarily that allowed CCAP dollars to be expended uh, in the course of a child care facility that was uh, having to close because of COVID. Um, what that meant for the child care facility and for the families that are getting their care there. Um, I want to understand um, what would happen if we extended that now um, and where the source of funding or if there is a source of funding required for that. Um, I think those are the questions that I have. I do, I do think this is an important thing when we think about families. Um, that we understand, I understand what you're um, talking about, Senator Abler, Chair Abler, about your concerns about the, the, the amount of funding that has come into the state of Minnesota and where it's going and wanting to keep track of that. Um, but I, I, I do think that understanding what this would cost, where that funding is coming from, if it's new funding, if it's current funding, um, and if we step away from this, what does it mean for the reliability of childcare um, over the period of time uh, between now and next January? Um, those are the questions that I would have for the department. And I would love it if I could get the information back or the committee could get the information back you know, on Monday, perhaps, before um, we come back to committee on Tuesday. 
um, so that we can discuss whether or not we include this. Mr. Chair. Sure. And I think the discussion will happen anyway. Um, and so whatever time we spend on Tuesday, we'll just eat into the governor's budget time. So um, that's why I'm trying to not, okay. And I actually forgot a whole topic. Um, but Senator Wickton, did you want to ask a question on this as well? And it may well be that Senator Murphy, we could just have a, a, a significant meeting even after Tuesday, um, just to help us understand. Because I don't think anybody at this table knows how the emergency funds feathers into that closed place as well. I, I believe that's a applicable, applicable use for people that have been closed. That's all I'm getting at. So and maybe part of this language is essential. You can just, you can discount for private or anyway. Senator Wickland, did you want to? offer anything else to this discussion? Ms. Postine's not gonna make it, it sounds like. Yeah, I think my my question would be just, is it, does it require, um, if we reinstate this waiver, does it require any um, change in funding? Does it require any new dollars? Um, or if it's, is it existing um, funds that um, DHS has allocated for CCAP um, and it will not negatively impact anyone who's, um, you know, e able to accept the CCAP subsidies. Um, I would just say again that I think that it's important to put this waiver back in place because, um, as you can see by the language, it's a retroactive statement. It goes back to November, which is when the Omicron um, variant started to have a very more significant impact on um, many, many people, and um, obviously that impacted childcare. Um, so I think providers um, have already been experiencing um, the need to close, um, which has which impacts their their finances um, significantly. Yeah. And so I think that that's we should take that into consideration. And, and this is about extending it only till June. So. And, and it has a limit on how many weeks it can be used. So to me, it's it's really important that we act on this. Okay, um, and so I, I think if uh, we could get some information from DHS, I forgot a whole topic we have to talk about uh, out of the waiver too to add on to this bill. There's a project we've worked on in the interim um, that uh, needs to be added into this. Um, so uh, to the department, and I think we'll have to have a meeting about this sometime. Um, Sooner or later, this is, bill is not going to become law on Tuesday. It's just going to begin a process, and there's also a place called the floor to, you know, fix things. Um, and this is going to go to finance. So there's a few steps along the way. So if, if I forgot to ask the question about the money. So if Mr. Burdick, if you could send us a memo with each section, what it might cost and what the money comes from, uh, and does it take new money or does it use old money? It's just waiting to be spent um, from the federal funds, which are free, um, sort of. Um, and then uh, the impact of this uh, could have, and then to Ms. Postine and her crew, um, if you can you get this funding out of the emergency money from the governor, the 20 million or the 70, and can you get it both? Um, and I'm curious about how many people have actually ever applied for anything resembling this, because I don't think anybody at the table knows that either. So to even see the impact we may have, and and is it uh, how is it between centers and homes? Can they both apply? Um, I think that'll give us a good start. And I think a memo to that effect would be useful. And then uh, you know we're anyway. So that that would be I think productive. Uh, Mr. Coleman, uh, in there also in our interim hearings, we talked about elderly waiver last year. The Senate promoted strongly and came away with uh, a successful uh, way to help the high end places. Uh, there needs to be some language to make that work better. Uh, there's an amendment that uh, Mr. Coleman and others have been working on that does not work, uh, but we need to, in my mind, it doesn't, the, the language you passed doesn't work either. Uh, the amendment that I would like us to adopt actually has a fiscal note of $3 million and $13 million. And I've made uh, all the advocates and anybody aware that when it gets to finance, leaving finance, it has to have a value of this. Zero. Um, so, um, and I, but I, if anybody knows what I've talked about a lot of, it's the God bless the elderly waiver places, the assisted livings that are taking high percentages of people on elderly waiver. 
because uh, some, including one in my own district, do not, and I'm so unhappy with them for that. Very pretty place, but uh, it's just wrong, I think. But I, I can't do the stick, so we're trying to get a carrot to reward and help folks stay open. So Mr. Coleman, do you want to do two minutes on that? And, and then I think we can just agree to your amendment as a work in progress. Thank Welcome you, Senator. To the uh, Thanks. Thank you, and uh, good to be with all of you again. A lot of familiar faces. First, I'd like to thank the, uh, uh, the Senator and the committee and the entire legislature for passing the elderly waiver uh, uh, rate floor that we worked on last session. Uh, it has helped a few providers, but not nearly as many as was anticipated. And so during the implementation process with DHS, we learned of some, uh, some obstacles for providers who are serving mostly low-income older Minnesotans uh, in the Medicaid program from participating or benefiting from the, uh, the rate floor. So we've been working with the department and Senator Abler to find some solutions. Uh, as he indicated, it is a work in progress. We've got a couple different versions that are uh, being explored. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have a recommendation today because we are still working with the department to find the solutions that would um, uh, recognize the providers that are <clears throat> serving uh, a dominant portion of the Medicaid population. I'll answer any questions anyone might have, but sorry to be a little bit uh, vague about this, but it's not finished, and I can't talk about something that I don't have uh, uh, more information about. Well, that's fine, And but the bottom line is that there's, I think, th at least three facilities that have come to Minnesota with the express purpose of serving high percentages of these individuals. Um, and their viability is at risk without trying to find some way to address that, as well as many of the others um, who are in serving high percentages. Is that a fair that, sentence? Mr. That Coleman? is correct, uh, Chair Abler. These three facilities that I'm familiar with were expressly built to serve uh, Medicaid enrollees and have done so. Yeah. Uh, but the rate system for elderly waiver is not sufficient when you have uh, that many Medicaid enrollees. Oh, sure. Uh, which causes many providers to limit the number of people uh, on the program in right. their community. Okay, and so uh, just I'm going to ask you the three cities there are, and then we're going to just talk to the committee. Uh, what cities are they in, Mr. Coleman? The, the Chair Abler, the three locations are St. Cloud, West St. Paul, and Brooklyn Center. All right. Well, thank you. Um, okay. Any so members, I don't have the language in front of us. Uh, the language that we have passed is irrelevant because it will not be the final language anyway. But it's it's uh, going to be some very uh, language that will require not recodification, just frankly restructuring um, uh, in finance, or it will fall off. If it costs money, it's not going to advance past finance. That's my agreement on this. Um, any concerns about that? Okay, just uh, thank you for your time. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll take up the two matters we talked about, the recodification and this bill. We'll have some discussions along the way. That's my commitment as well. Try to have a con kind of a consensus sort of committee. We don't want to always agree, but we have to always listen and find the best way. Uh, and then on Thursday, next week, is going to be substance abuse uh, day. Uh, we're going to talk about some restructuring, some separating out some uh, behavioral health services at DHS. We're going to talk about how we approve uh, RCOs. We're going to talk about substance abuse. And the whole day is going to be that topic. Uh, we're not going to move any bills out that day, I don't think. Not those two in particular. They need work. Um, and um, and if, there's, if there's things you uh, want to work on, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. If there's things you're interested in doing, let us know so we can schedule it. Um, I believe all the voices need to be included, and so I'm all in for that. Uh, this has been, I think, for the students of the legislature, one of the most committee-ish committee processes I remember having. So anyway, with that, uh, God bless. Have a nice weekend. We're adjourned.